Welcome to the Strong Single and Human podcast, a real look at single parenting, how to navigate the ups and downs of life with kids on your own while keeping sane. We cover all manner of subjects from domestic violence, dealing with childhood trauma, through to fussy eaters and how to help your kids become resilient. I'm your host, Claire Martin. Welcome. This week's guest, Savan Hong's career spans over two decades in several industries and professions, including holding esteemed positions as a professor at New York University's Stern School of Business and a former partner at the Briggs Span Group. However, today, Savan authors and illustrates the best-selling children's book series, The Super Fun Day Books including Benji J and The Horrible Halloween, George J and The Miserable Monday, Emily D and The Fearful First Day, and Avery G and The Scary End of School. Her inspiring books focus on neurodiverse children who overcome their challenges with perseverance and bravery. The Super Fun Day books have even been featured on NBC and News 12. Savan also serves as a trustee on the board of the Rita Allen Foundation, Multicultural Children's Book Day and the ASPCA. This is the Strong Single and Human Podcast. Hi, welcome to the podcast, Savan. Welcome Seems like we haven't spoken for ages, but welcome finally to the podcast. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. And yes, it does feel like we haven't spoken in ages. <laughs> well, it was probably last year. So that's a whole long time ago. No, that look, that's cool. Look, thank you, sir. Because you're really busy. I can't get you on. Um, <laughs> look, thank you for giving your time up. Um, it's nighttime where you are. It's it daytime. is nighttime where I am. I know. Amazing yeah. how that works. Scary, isn't it? <laughs> um, so look, tell us a little bit about your journey and how you've got how you came to start writing books. Sure. So um I had no idea that I was gonna become a writer. Uh I hated reading when I was in school. Absolutely worst subject ever. Wow. Um and I, I actually failed spelling when I was in elementary school um, because it turned out that I'm neurodivergent and reading was hard for me. But back in those days, they never tested people the way they do today. Oh, yeah. And they certainly didn't test um, girls. Right. Like. Wow. Well, yeah, that's true. Right? I mean, there's like, so many girls now getting diagnosed or ladies now getting diagnosed. Yes. Um, and so, you know, it was never something that was kind of top of mind. It didn't feel like it would be a possibility for me. And then we kind of fast forward many years and I have two incredibly wonderful neurodivergent boys and they ah. amazing. So fun. So great trouble. Cause you know, all kids can be trouble, but, um, Definitely. <laughs> but, you know, because they got diagnosed, I started to recognize, wait a minute, you know, there's some symptoms that they have that look shockingly familiar. And like many, many parents, I realized that I needed to go get tested myself. And I did. Um, and that's how I discovered that I was neurodivergent. And in that process, um, I recognized that there was kind of a gap in the market, for, for lack of a better term, around children's books, picture books in particular, that highlighted neurodivergent characters in positive and fun ways. And so the first book I wrote um, all of my books are true stories that happened to my kids, but but was about a little boy and in the United States, Halloween happens in October. That's not the case for everybody, but in 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 where we live, it is right. And yeah, no, where we are, it does. Yeah. Ah, okay, good. So um, end of October, mind you, it would be like we would be celebrating it, and it would be like 
the 30th for you or the yeah, day before that's good. You're I'll, where I'll, you are. But, hey. but yes, the kids all dress up. It's loads of fun. Um, but in my mind, it's loads of fun. But my kin- then kindergartner refused to go to the Halloween parade. He was all dressed up, ready to go to school, and wouldn't get out of the car. And I couldn't understand why he- this is supposed to be this great fun day at school. He has his costume on. And I felt like the biggest failure as a parent because I felt like something is not being communicated. I don't understand wow. my child, right? My child is in a place of stress and distress. And it is so beyond my understanding to understand why he wouldn't get out of the car and why he wouldn't go celebrate. And so it took about a year to figure out what all of those different drivers were that led to his anxiety. And, you know, one of them was he wasn't sure if he would recognize his friends because they were all in costume and that felt scary. Or another one um, was that he sometimes wore headphones in class because things were loud and the parade is going to be loud, but could he wear headphones with his costume? And so he he we finally figured out there was a list of about five things that that made this day really hard. And so the book talks about those five things and then it gives the five things that solve those problems. And so at the end, he has this wonderful day and they are real world examples of what you can use with your kids to actually solve those types of situations. And it was the first picture book that I had ever seen that actually had an illustration of a child wearing headphones. And for me, that normalizes it, right? When you see it in a picture book, it's okay. It's not weird. It's not strange. It's okay. And so for kids who need to wear headphones, it makes them feel like this book is about me. And for kids who don't, it helps them understand why there may be a kid in their class that does wear headphones. So that was the first book. And um, I had no idea what I was doing, Claire, at all. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Well, at the end of the day, you were doing it for your child, right? I was doing it for my child, yes. Exactly. So in a way, why you started writing books wasn't because you wanted to get out there, write books, make money, do all of the things that like some people might want to start writing books for, um, you know, um, but you were just doing it to help your child. That's right. And to make things normal for them and say, hey, look, it's okay. There's a lot of other children who do this, and and actually, all of the que- like all of the questions your child had regarding why Halloween was so scary to them and why they didn't really want to go to the are actually understandable. They're not like crazy questions, right? They're like understandable questions that potentially I've got to go to a dead ball soon, right? Um, so my stepdaughter's dead ball, her. Her mum, this is how weird our relationship is. So her mum, my ex-partner's ex-wife, <laughs> we got on really well, right? So I've got two stepdaughters. My brother's got that, uh, my brother. My son has got two half-sisters. And the eldest one has a dead ball, right? I've never been to one. We didn't, they didn't have dead balls in my time, right? Okay. I don't actually even know. Like I know it's a ball that at high school kids go to. And they go in fancy cars and they have like (laughs) fancy dresses. But I didn't think the parents had to go, right? And they're going, oh, no, 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 we go. We get dressed up and we go, right? And I'm like, well, what do we need to do, right? (laughs) But this is the thing, right? I'm sitting there going, okay, what's the dress code, right? What... What do I need to do? What do I need to bring? What? So I'm a little bit anxious because I've never been to one, right? And I'm going... Okay, and all the questions your son asked for his Halloween parade and things, um, I go, well, I'm asking exactly the same things for this dead ball. That's right. And That's right. And I'm not neurodiverse. <laughs> I'm not that I know of, but, you know, like, I don't believe I am. And so I'm not neurodiverse, but I'm still anxious. So it's understandable. Yes. Um, but I'm an adult, right? So I can go, what do I need to do? I mean, lover my stepdaughter went google it just google it right so that's the answer for everything for these kids now just and I'm like 
but Google it. But that's not going to give me the answers. But anyway, but like your son can do that, right? right? And also he's trying to communicate, right? So, yeah, wow. But So how did you get the information out of him? Because sometimes like, I've got friends, sorry, I've got friends who, oh, they have challenges every day. I was funny, I was talking to somebody the other day about this. And and a lot of people I know who have newer diverse kids, sometimes it can be really hard to get that child to school, right? Like they can, you know, drive them to school and get them so they can have problems getting them dressed in the morning and getting them in the car to go to school. They can have problems getting them out of the car like you, right? And 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 they felt exactly and they feel exactly like you, right? My child has an issue but I don't know how to solve it and I don't know what the problem is. So how did you how did you get to the bottom? How did you find out that those were the things that affected him? Um, originally it was a lot of guesswork, right? To try to say, okay, if I put myself into his shoes, let me take off my lens of this is such a fun day and what could go wrong, right? It, how could I try to put myself in his shoes? And then, of course, I had the support of his teachers and other school officials to 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 kind of work with him and see what we could get out. But like I said, it took about a year to really understand what was going on. But um, you said, you know, the, the morning routine can be very hard for neurodivergent kids because change is hard. So the second book I wrote was about miserable Mondays. And it's about a little boy <laughs> who doesn't want to go to school on Monday because that's change, you know? And what if somebody moved his seat or what if they changed the schedule and they don't have recess anymore? And all of wow. the worries that happen um, with little kids, particularly neurodivergent kids, but, but like you said, anybody um, about, you know, all the things that go into their heads to help them get to school on Monday. And books are these beautiful ways to spark conversations, you know? And if if you read a book to your child and, and the kid in the book relates to your child, your child's gonna open up about that experience and to say, yes, that's me. But, it, but your child may also say, but also, and say other things that are going on. You know, it, it, it's not just this one size fits all, it really becomes a tool for parents and educators to have these conversations with their kids. And it, it's much easier for the kids to talk about what the character is feeling sometimes and what they are feeling themselves. Yes. So sort of to divert the attention away mm -hmm. from, oh, this is how I feel, to go, oh, I wonder if X, I don't know, I'm trying to think, I wonder if Benji was like feeling like X because he couldn't do Y or yeah, whatever. Exactly. Wow, exactly. that's so good. I, just while I'm sitting here, I'm thinking, did you have to write the books in a particular way so that neurodiverse children could read them? Because I know at the beginning you said you hated reading, you hated, you weren't very good at spelling and all of this stuff, right? So is there, a, do, do neurodiverse children actually absorb information from storybooks in a different way to other children? So I love this question because it gets to two different points. The first one is that that neurodivergence is a huge spectrum, right? There are kids on the yes. that are dyslexic. There are kids uh, who are autistic or ADHD, and it's this huge gamut. And even within each of those diagnoses, it looks different, right? And so there may be one child who has something called hyperlexia, which means that they can read like nobody's business when they're four years old. Um, but you may have another child yeah. who struggles with reading when they are seven. So there isn't this one size fits all. But there is a tool that I use in all my books um, that is used in special education called a social story. And what it does is it lays out in a list all of the different problems, and then it gives the solutions in a list so that it creates a framework by which a child can then understand what's happening in a very simplified way. The books don't read like a typical story that kind of 
ebbs and flows and it's very, very kind of structured. And that makes it much easier for these this group of kids to be able to digest it. I also have all of my books available as audiobooks, even though they're picture books, because kids absorb that information in a lot of different ways. The only way I read now is through audiobooks. And I am a voracious <laughs> reader, right? Yeah. But, but Isn't that nuts though, right? You hated reading. Hated it. Previously, I hated it. And then as life has moved along and different things have been invented, good old, and I I should so get sponsored by these guys, right? But good old Audible, Auditable, Audible. Yes. Oh, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't be sponsored by them because I can't pronounce it. But, but those guys, like I have them on my phone and when I'm cutting the lawn mm. or when I'm hanging washing or cooking dinner or whatever, I have an audio book on. Yes. Me too. Um, as well as podcasts, because, you know, podcasts are awesome too. They sure as are. As this one is. <laughs> but, you know, at the end of the day, like I do, because it's just quicker for me because I'm a single mum and, you know, single parents don't yeah. have much time. Um, you're sort of cooking dinner while listening to it because I don't get the time to – I don't travel to work. So um, I occasionally have to be in the office, but most of the time I work from home. So at the end of the day, I don't have that travel journey now either – to sit and listen to it. So I have to do it while I'm doing other stuff because I'm, I'm busy. Well, and you find listening to them awesome because that's how you do it. That's how I it. do it. And look, my kids do it too. You know, like, and at first I was like, am I doing a disservice to them? Right. Do they have to sit there and physically read with their eyes, with the book, or do I open their kind of world to literature using audiobooks so that they can love reading. And and the way I think about it is I wouldn't tell somebody that if they were reading with braille that because they weren't using their eyes they couldn't read. So why would I tell my no. kids that using your ears isn't reading? I don't care how the words end up in their brain. All I care about is that they love books. And they love the story and they connect with the characters. That's all I care about. And so it, it it's taken some time to kind of accept that. And, and I don't necessarily think every educator out there is going to agree with me. But at the end of the day, I think that's the future, you know, to have all sorts of different mediums depending on how you learn. I think you have to do what works. And at the end of the day, people learn you know, visual learners, you've got auditory learners and you've got kinesthetic learners. Um, I think I'm kinesthetic. I have to do stuff because otherwise I just don't learn it. Um, but but they're, they're the three categories that I know of and I'm sure because I haven't studied this for a long time, but I'm sure there are other categories that are like in between all of That's those, right? right? The, yeah. Um, and the thing is, who cares, right? Exactly like you said, right? Why force a child to physically read a book if that's not the way that it infuses them and gets it into their body um, and gets them actually learning and understanding and being passionate about stuff? Right, instead of hating it. Going to school yeah. and hating reading. Like you. Like I did. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so so how do your books work? As your books are picture books, how do your books work as an auditory book? Um, auditory, yeah, that's, yeah. So um, I have a, a professional actress and she does the voices and she reads it out and, um, and kids can follow along with the, oh, the actual okay. hardcover if they want. But kids can listen to it in the car too. And the, the pictures don't create the story. The pictures are just there to add to the story so that the story can stand alone. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. So I know we've been talking about this a lot, right? Um, and I would imagine, because I've had quite a few um, people on the podcast who talk about neurodiversity um, and those sort of things, but what, Quintessentially, what is neurodiversity, right? What what actually, what does it mean? What does, like, how does it affect children and adults for that matter? 
So, and I know that's a really broad no, subject. but it's good because we <laughs> don't want to keep bantering with this word unless it's kind of clear. So neurodiversity was a term coined in the 1990s to talk about the fact that people's brains are structured differently. That these weren't necessarily deficits that people had, but differences, right? And so just like some people are tall and some people are short and you have blonde hair and I have mostly gray hair now, but we'll say brown hair. Um, I've covered up my gray hair, so don't worry. That's why it's blonde. <laughs> but so they there are these differences in people. And one of the ways people are different is in the way their brain works, right? And so the, this term neurodiversity covers all sorts of kinds of brain differences. And it really tries to focus on the fact that it's different, not a deficit, right? That that there are- And I love how you've put that. that. Come with it. There are huge- Exactly. That come with it. Exactly. I love how you put that because I sit there and I look at it and I go, ADHD people t tend to not focus on the stuff they're not interested in, right? <laughs> they don't, that's boring to them, right? Now, it may be that they need to focus on that stuff, but when they focus on something that they're passionate about, oh, by golly, they focus on it 110%, right? Which is a different focus to maybe somebody like myself that doesn't have ADHD. So it's just that they have a different superpower, right? That's because, right. you know, they go, oh, pfft, I'm going to discount that because I'm not interested. You know, I don't, I'm not interested in writing, right? <laughs> say, for example, sake. And I'm going, and I go, well, I know I need to have writing. Um, so I know I'm going to have to do that. But they go, nah, I'm bored of that. I want to do art or I want to produce music or I want to do something that I'm really passionate about. And so they do that. And they focus on it 110% of the time, whereas I'm like focusing on everything, right? And um, and they're just super, super like detailed on that stuff. And they'll look at things that I maybe would have missed. So, you know, and that, I mean, ADHD, I sort of know a bit more about than than other neurodiversities, but um, but yeah. So, so let like- me, Let me give you an example. There, there was a- a study done recently at Harvard University here in the United States, and they took a bunch of PhDs in astrophysicists. So all really, really smart oh, people, wow. right? Like super smart people. And they gave them images of black holes and they divided them up between people who had dyslexia and people who didn't. And the ones who had dyslexia had like a three or four time greater chance of being able to identify the black holes than the people who didn't. Now, these are kids who, when they were in school, probably felt pretty bad about themselves because they couldn't read like everybody else. But look at what they can do, right? Their spatial awareness looks very different than a typical person and is such a superpower but yet when they're in second grade, they feel dumb because they can't read the way somebody else does, right? And so it's this awareness that with some of these challenges, and there are challenges because the education system is designed for neurotypical kids, there are challenges. Very much so. But there are unbelievable strengths that come with this that if you can recognize them, end up being huge for these people and frankly, huge for society. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, yeah. Um, I think schools are now switching on to this, but they need to switch on maybe a little bit quicker. Although like, you know, it like, I don't know. Um, and I think what we do is, I know in Australia, we do this quite a bit. We actually focus on grades and point systems and various different other things within the school. Right. So therefore, if you have a neurodiverse child who isn't actually achieving set points and things like that to enable that school to go up in a grading table so that they can attract more people to the school etc cetera, etc cetera, right then that child then gets um penalized for want of a better word i think penalized or may even potentially and i know there's a lot of places 
that this doesn't happen at, but potentially could get pushed out of the school because they don't actually want to encourage those sort of children at the school. So I, I think we need to incorporate everyone, all the neurodiverse children into the schools, cater for them. And also if we can give them their own schools that encourage and give them passion in their own ways. Um, Children are cruel. My son wears glasses. Um, and basically he gets bullied for wearing glasses. Right. Um, and he's not neurodiverse or anything like that. And I would hate to understand, um, how a neurodiverse child could feel isolated and you know, how I know I've been to school, how evil children can be sometimes, um, without actually realizing, right. So there's those situations as well. So I think there's a whole massive education upheaval that needs to happen. So look, um, and that sort of leads me into my next question, really. So like, how do we get, how do we help our children who are neurodiverse to, to cope with life? And, and like, because I know there's a lot of single parents as well as parents out there who have neurodiverse children who are just simply like you put at the beginning, right? Feel helpless that they can't help their kids. Right? So how do we, how do we try and set our kids up to cope with life in general? Look, this is going to sound a bit Pollyanna-ish, and it's not at all. But if we don't talk to our kids about how brilliant and wonderful and amazing they are, there is no way the rest of the world is going to see them that way, right? And no. as parents, it's on us to say, okay, you may have a hard time with handwriting right now because you don't have those fine motor skills and that's hard for you. But look at all these amazing things you can do, right? Like you can do that puzzle faster than anybody else in your grade or whatever it is, but really focusing on their strengths, religiously focusing on those strengths and constantly pointing it out to them. Because like you said, the other kids will point out everything that's different, right? Oh, they do it. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are. If you have the slightest bit difference, they're going to point it out. So as parents, we have to be these cheerleaders to really say, you know, you're incredible. You have these gifts. And while right now it's hard and there may be moments that it's really hard to parent these children, that has to be the focus. Because if we don't do it, nobody else is going to. Yeah, I know. I know. I agree. I agree. And I think as a parent, of a non-neurodiverse child, right, is what I'm going to call him, right, because I don't believe he's neurodiverse. Nobody's raised it with me, but he could be, right? But um, I think as a, as a parent of a non-neurodiverse child, it's about tolerance for the parents of the neurodiverse children, right, because I've got a lot of friends who have autistic children, um, Asperger's, all of the various different gamut, ADHD and all of those things, right? In fact, my eldest stepdaughter has, has ADHD, right? She only got just recently diagnosed and she's now going to be 18, right? So that's a bit of a shocker, right? But um, but the thing is, um, it's about us actually helping other parents who have neurodiverse kids, right? It's a hard job, right? Whether they're single parents, coupled parents it doesn't really matter right because that they you've got to deal with the neurodiverse child um so it could be that they don't actually um are able to they're not able to understand empathy so if they want something they just go and take it right instead of going oh please may i share that with you or whatever cuz cuz that's not the switch that's switched on in their head it's another switch that you know they've got another superpower that they need to right. deal with so I, you know, I think it's very important for us to just not parent judge. We shouldn't child parent judge. judge ever. No. Right, ever, no, no matter what. <laughs> right? Like it doesn't no. matter what state that child is in. Um, being a parent is hard enough. I know. <laughs> it's like all it's like the like if I suppose, and I don't know, so you can tell me, because the only thing that I can think of is that being a parent of a neurodiverse child, 
um, is a bit like having your child sometimes because because sometimes they're awesome and they do great, awesome things. But sometimes when they're not doing what's been expected, it's a bit like having a child, your child screaming on an aeroplane and everybody looking at you. Am I, am I right in actually Absolutely. that sort of? But we, yeah. I feel like every parent of a neurodiverse child at some point or other has had that feeling or yeah. that moment. Um, and, that is- and all you're wanting is somebody to come over and go, hey, Wow, that's an awesome picture when whatever they've scribbled on the wall or yes. whatever. Yes. Or just <laughs> or a to smile, just go, right? Just yeah. a smile to be like, you got it, mama. You know, like yeah. that's you know. Exactly. And and I you know, like we we've seen those parents on the airplane with the screaming child and the you just want to give them a hug. I remember I was actually yeah. on a flight with my two kids when they were like two and four. I, by wow. you know by myself and um I had parents high-fiving me what a difference that makes right like high five you go mom. like and all of a sudden it's like okay I can do this I think as parents that's what we have to do for each other yeah 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 no I agree I agree so how many books have you actually written at the moment because I know that I know there's quite a few like I think like what have you got five books so uh, have you written any more since we've spoken (laughs) come on I know I'm slacking (laughs) um I have four books out and then I have a hardcover collection of the four because I want it it, it, it's frankly it's much more economical to buy four books in one than it is to buy four separate books and for me, it's all about getting these books out there and in the hands of as many people who need them. Um, big surprise being a children's book author, unless you're Dr. Seuss, is not like the cash cow that one thinks it is. You do it because you love it, right? Like, And for me, I get emails from parents who talk about how much these books have mattered in the lives of their kids. And that's what we, that's what, you know, like I wake up in the morning and that's what drives it. I'm working on a fifth book about the holidays because, as we know, the winter holidays can be stressful for all of us. Oh. <laughs> yes. So yes. that will be exactly that book will be coming out before the holidays. But and I illustrate all of them as well because yourself, I do. Again, oh my gosh, I had no idea I could do this either. But um, it, I did not want books. The picture books with unbelievable illustrations. And I would sit there with my kids and they would, I'd be reading the story. And instead of focusing on the story, one of my kids would be like, well, why is there a red book on the bookshelf back there? Right? Like, because if they have detail again, detail, ADHD, (laughs) they're not going to necessarily focus on the story. So my illustrations are very deliberately simple. Um, and so I do them myself and all the font I use is dyslexic friendly. So again, I'm trying to make everything be as accessible to my audience as it can possibly be. Yes. Wow. And so did you, so you had this epiphany and said, right, I'm going to write these books. So then did you approach publishers or did you, are you self-published or did you approach, well, how did you get this all out there in, in the world? So um, I've had, uh, the, traditional publishers have wanted to publish my books, but then they want to change them <laughs> to make them what? more typical. Um, and I don't want that. So no. I decided to create a publishing company myself and I publish them through the publishing company um, yes. so that I have the control and make them the way they need to be for my audience of kids. Look at you. You're unstoppable. Neurodiversity, focused on what you want to do. That's right. Unstoppable. That is my hyper focus in action. Yeah. <laughs> no, exactly right. It's awesome. So look, where can people have a look? And if they want to have a look and if they want to buy the books, buy the books. Sure. Uh, Whereabouts are they? um, In Australia, the easiest way to get them is through Amazon because then the shipping is not very expensive. 
Um, so that's usually where I would send most of my international um, buyers. Um, they're also available at Barnes and Nobles, but I do think they're cheaper from Amazon. So I would go that route. Um, and then my website also has teacher and parent guides that are free to download for anybody that were written by psychologists to help you navigate the books with your children if you so want to or to use in a classroom. Um, so those are there for anybody who wants. And like I said, those are free. Cool. Brilliant. Brilliant. And look, um, oh, do you know what I had? To this? Oh, here we go. This question in my head and then popped out and then it's popped back. In <laughs> um, you said you can listen to the books as well. Where can people listen to them if they want to listen to them? To your favorite company. They are on Audible. <laughs> oh, God, I hear this audible okay i need a bit of money to keep this podcast going come on guys um no awesome okay that's brilliant that's fantastic um they are the top place to go to listen to books so that's what i do i know exactly exactly no that's great that's great and um and so, sorry, what was your website? Did you give your website? So I haven't, but so um, I am the only Savan Hong in the entire world. So it makes it oh very easy. Oh, my God, easy. the I only know, one? The only one. The only one. Easy um, peasy then. Easy. So um, you just go to SavanHong.com. Um, Fantastic. And that's my website. Yep. Okay. And if then anyone if knows, want, if anyone yeah, knows another Savan Hong, just please tell let us. Me know because, because, yeah. They don't, that, that person does not exist. I can yeah. assure you. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted also, you. I, I also have a lot of content about neurodiversity and being an, a parent of neurodiverse kids on my Instagram um, account, which is Savan underscore Hong underscore author. So if you want a lot of information and positivity about being a neurodivergent parent and neurodivergent kids, um, me you can follow me there too awesome no that's that's great that's awesome and i'll put all of those links in the blurb that goes with the podcast so that's okay that's cool Wonderful. if anyone wants to fight find you <laughs> so hey look um who inspires you who actually because this i mean you've just done so much written these books you've put them on audible my favorite website put them and your favorite website put them on audible you've then didn't want publishing companies to mess around with your books, so created your own publishing company, which is nuts. So, like, who inspires you? My kids. Ah, oh, right. It, of course. Like, and I, because it's their stories, so they are part of the process with me. They pick the names of the characters for the books. Oh, awesome. And um, they put their teachers in there, so all the teacher characters are real teachers that my kids have had. Um, and so they become part of the process because I need it to be their authentic voice. It has to represent what they feel. So they're my test subjects. And I'm like, is this what it was like? And what about this and this? And so they're part of it. And so I do it for them and I do it for all the other parents who are also going through this so that they realize that they're not alone. And I not. think that's key. I think that's key, um, you know. We, we all need to realize that we're not alone, like single parents, parents of neurodiverse children, whether you're single or not single parents. Right. Um, you know, because sometimes you do sit there and and sometimes it can be a lonely, you know, lonely existence with a neurodiverse kid. Right. Because it also and also as a single parent, because um, they may not get invited to quite as many children's parties if they're in a mainstream school. You know, and they might not get invited to that many birthday parties or, you know, um, yeah, or if they have a birthday party themselves, having kids come from school to their birthday party. They might send an invite to everyone, but that ch those children might go, oh, I don't really, don't really want to go to their birthday party, which is sad. Um, it's sad, but, but, but these are children, and I think yeah. we just have to kind of, recognize that like the path that you are on is a path that other people have walked down right and that it is okay to raise your hand and say how did you do it and what worked for you right and and um because look when you get a diagnosis for your for your child you go through a mourning period you wow. just do because you, do you 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 
realize the things you thought were going to be for your kid, right? And we all do this as parents. Gradually, you have these dreams when the child is in your womb and you're like, here's what they're going to be like. And you have all this. And slowly over time, the reality of who they are and who they want to be kind of happens. Oh, yeah. But this is but this is whether they're jarring. neurodiverse, whether right. they're neurodiverse or not, you sit there and but go, this, "Oh my god, this isn't right. what I thought being a parent was going to be." <laughs> but this is very jarring because you get this laundry list of everything that is wrong with your kid, right? And it feels like you've been punched in the stomach because you're like, "This is everything that's wrong with my kid. Where's all the stuff that's good?" Right. And so you go through this process and you should realize that there are other parents out there who've gone through that process and can help you. Right. And can say there's a way out. You know, there this past spring, there was a um, there was a story about two nonverbal autistic kids who graduated from University of Berkeley. Right. Which is a top, top. It is school in Berkeley, the United yeah. States. And they're nonverbal. And you can imagine that when these parents at probably three or four, and they were like, why isn't my child speaking? But they went through thinking about what kind of life their child may have, not realizing my kid's going to graduate from UC I Berkeley. Know. Right. And so, like, there is a lot of hope out there and a lot of support out there you just have to raise your hand and say i need help yeah yeah and and i also think that with having your child diagnosed with uh, with a neurodiversity right i'm wondering if there's a lot of questions around what I, what have i done when my child was inside me or, mm -hmm. you know, before I conceived my child, what has there been things that I've done that would have meant that my child is neurodiverse as such, as such. Yes, um, yes. and you go through all of that guilt situation. And I don't, I mean, I don't fully know, but I don't believe, I mean, a lot of it, a lot of the neurodiversity they've they say is hereditary i.e if you've got somebody in your family like i believe i believe although i don't believe he's diagnosed but i believe my ex-partner is adhd which is why the eldest is adhd yep. and potentially some people have actually raised with me that my son might be adhd and i'm like right okay nobody else has mentioned it to me so i'm like okay um but you know with these sort of things that they can actually come down through the family. I mean, like you've said, you're neurodiverse, your children are neurodiverse. Um, but then there are some people who aren't neurodiverse who have a neurodiverse children, child, child, children, uh, yep. <laughs> whatever, however many they have. Um, and so therefore, like, could I have prevented this, you know, um, all of those sort of factors that I don't yep. actually believe we know, we don't know why neurodiversity is out there. No, and and it's, you know, it what they do know, it's not because of something you ate, right, while you were pregnant or, you know, things like that. They don't know why, you know, the genes manifest themselves in the way they do. Um, and that's okay, because if you focus on it as, these are the strengths my kid has. This is how my child's brain is different. They may not have, you know, brown hair, but they have blonde hair. I'm not going to be upset. I'm not going to be upset that their brain is different, right? I just have to focus on how does my child learn? It's going to look different, but the end result is going to be great. And, and it you, might be evolution. That, we that's might be right. evolving. Yes. That's right. It's you like know, if they're like little different beings. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly right. <laughs> little X Men is a good description because it's right. Um, yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Look, final question. Final question. Um, and it can't be one of your books, I'm afraid. <laughs> but if you could recommend, if you could recommend a book to my listeners, what would it be and why? So there is a book I read when my first 
child was diagnosed with ADHD um, by someone who I have no connection with whatsoever. He's a psychologist called Dr. Hallowell, and he actually also has a website. And his book is something called um, ADHD Parenting. And it applies to all neurodiversity, I think, but it really focuses on how to look at your child's strength and how to parent them through strength. And when I finished that book, it got me out of that funk of right. of, of like, how did this happen? And it's happened and woe yeah. is me and everything's wrong and changed the way I thought about neurodiversity. Mm. Um, and so, like I said, he has a website. There's lots of resources there. I'm completely unaffiliated uh, with him. I've never met him. But if you are going through this process, I highly recommend you checking out that book because it will change the way you think about it. And in that book, he actually gives a, an example, which is what I use with my kids when I told them, because they both have ADHD and one's also autistic, but um it says, you have a race car brain. Your brain is faster than everybody else's so you can win the race. The problem is right now your brain goes too fast so it jumps off the curves and so you crash. So you oh. need to learn how to take those curves slowly so that you can win the race. And so what a positive way to say, no, no, your brain is really good. You just need to learn how to stay on the tracks. And I described that to my kids and they were like, Oh, okay. That's good. Okay. And they don't, right. They don't feel embarrassed about their brain differences because they don't look at it as a deficit. They look at and they it shouldn't. as a difference. That's right. And they shouldn't. There's many awesome businessmen and business ladies who um, have ADHD. Oh yeah. And the one reason they're successful is because their ADHD enables them to race along the racetrack and right win when our brains are oh, being collective me uh, our brains <laughs> aren't able to race along the racetrack and win right because we have to go slowly around the corners whereas they've learned to take the corners and you know cut the corners a bit to be able to win and focus on doing what they're doing it's, it's right. like awesome wow so, okay well look thank you for that because i think that book will definitely help a lot of people i'm hoping it will help a lot of people and just to change my view on here is um i don't see neurodiversity as a deficit it's a difference right it's a superpower it's a, it's a different superpower so i it's nice that you know you know we're all on the same i just want more people to be on this track that we're on but um look it's lovely to speak to you thank you so much for oh, coming back you, on board Claire. it's been a bit hit and miss trying to get you on the podcast but we're here now and we've done it um and yeah, look, I wish you every success with everything you're doing. Oh, come on, you, get the Steve. next book out. Get and that next and we book need out. we need Audible to listen to this so that they can be your sponsor. Oh, we so do. Right, we get out there. <laughs> have words. Once you get your next book written and you actually put it up there on Audible, <laughs> you have to say, "Hey, look, I've been on this awesome podcast." Now nah, we'll we'll see. They'll pick me up. I'm sure they will. Um. <laughs> But it's all good. It's all good. Look, I'm going to let you go and enjoy your evening. Thank you so much again for oh, coming on here. thank you for having me, Claire. No, that's thank okay. Um, and we'll get you back when you've written your next book. Sounds good. Sounds Yay. good. All right. See you later. Bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast and you would like to hear more, please hit subscribe wherever you like to hear podcasts. If you would like to support us further, share this episode with your friends and family. And finally, drop us a review on iTunes as I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments and ideas. It all helps me to understand and produce awesome content you want to hear just like this. If you want to check out our past episodes, write to us, appear on the podcast or for links, resources and show notes go to our website, www.strongsingleandhuman.com. We are also on all the usual social media platforms, Insta, Facey and Twitter. I hope you have a wonderful week and I hope to see you back here again soon. 
Be kind to yourself and remember, no one is perfect. We're all just putting one foot in front of the other and doing our best. I'm Claire Martin and you've been listening to the Strong, Single and Human podcast.